it. My name is John Clark. I'm with the German Village Society, and we're here at the German Village Society Meeting House on Wednesday, November 15th, 2017. And would you give me your names, please, and spell them for me? My name is Mary Kramer, M-A-R-Y-K-R-A-M-E-R. -E and my name is Charles Kramer, K-R-A-M-E-R. -E Father and daughter. Yes. That's right. Well, I know you both have a lot of history to tell, and Mr. Kramer, I'm very appreciative for you to make the trip down here. You live where now? Uh, in Westerville. In Westerville. And, and Mary, you live near? I live in North Columbus. North Columbus. So, Charlie, if you would, just give us a sense of the kind of history you and your family have down here. Um, well, going back how far and where and that sort of thing. Uh, well, that'll be fine, John. Uh, uh, I was born in Columbus, Ohio, uh, to uh, uh, my mother, Eleanor Kramer, and her husband, Charles. Uh, we lived at 215 Whittier Street. If you're familiar with German Village, that's where Fifth Avenue ed dead ends right at Whittier Street. If you keep going, you'll, you'll go right into our front yard. South Fifth Street, right, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, I uh, spent an awful lot of time uh, at Schiller Park. Uh, I could never understand how anyone could ever, ever get along without having a park. I probably spent more time in Schiller Park than I did in school. Uh, I enjoyed Charlie, the park. How old are you? Would, would you mind giving me your birth date so we'll get a sense of exactly oh, how far uh, back we're going? Oh, my birthday is uh, no, November 10th, 1926. I just turned 91 a few uh, days ago. 91, happy birthday. And so the period of time we're talking about when you were a kid and playing with uh, in Schiller Park would have been, what, the late 30s, early 40s, something like that? Yeah. Uh, Late 30s, uh, middle 30s, middle 30s. Middle 30s. But uh, uh, from the time I could walk, I was and was able to be on my own. I was in Schiller Park. I often, I often tell people uh, there was a gentleman over there that lived in that house over there in Schiller Park, and his name was Snyder. He was a good guy, but uh, he chased us kids all over the place because we weren't allowed to fish in that pond over there. And uh, we would take a, we would, <laughs> we would take a, we didn't have much money and we had no money to spend our own, so we'd take a pin and bend it into a hook <laughs> and put it on a piece of string and, and put some bread on it over there and catch, catch a little bit of fish. But it's a strange thing, the, the pond's changed an awful lot over there. And, and uh, right there where that bridge is, which has been changed an awful lot, there was a lot, a lot of big bushes and we would hide it in bushes. <laughs> and, and he'd come over there and chase us out. And, uh, what we'd do, we'd just go, go run and climb up a tree or something. But it was all harmless. Oh yeah, oh, it never hurt anything. I, I think he kind of got a kick out of, of, of the way we acted over there. But uh, children back then, it, it, it was just a little bit different. We, we all were friends. Uh, in my, in my whole life, even as a child, I only remember having one fist fight in my life. Uh, I, I don't have one enemy in the world. I love people. And uh, like, I like what we're doing here, I, I, we go, my, my children and I go over to Schiller Park quite often. Uh, even today, when I was working, I was sales manager for her. Uh, Smith's Transfer Trucking Company, and quite often, and instead of uh, uh, going out to lunch, I'd go over there and have a sandwich and and uh, just kind of rest a little bit. But Schiller Park, there's nothing like Schiller Park. Uh, I know there are lots of parks around. The history of Schiller Park uh, goes way back, uh, way back prior to the war. Uh, during the war, it was kind of tough. Uh, uh, we have a large statue of, uh, of uh, uh, Mr. Schiller over there. And 
Uh, during the war, at one time, somebody went and whitewashed that uh, statue, but uh, that's a thing of the past, and uh, Germany is on our side now, I hope. But uh, uh, would you like to, be, to describe Schiller Park a little bit the way it was? Yes, I'd love to know how different it okay, looked then during uh, the 30s. Uh, at one time, there was a, a, a large hill right where the lake, uh, just north of the lake, just a, ma a matter of a few yards. It was a large hill, and there was an impression inside of that hill, and we called it the lion's den. And uh, my knowledge of the history of it is that at one time they did have some bears in that, uh, in that particular uh, uh, facility, and it was called the lion's den. Uh, uh, I, uh, in talking to some other people, they'll, they'll say there, there have been all kinds of things in that, that place, but my, my uh, recollection is that it was a bear's den at one time, mm -hmm. but that was well before my time. Were there rocks there as well, like rock walls or something it around It was a this? hole. There was a hole about, uh, oh, maybe about 30 foot by 30 foot and probably about 12 foot deep. And, and it was, uh, uh, it had a rock, rock stone uh, as, a, as a, a sides to all the walls. And that, that's why I feel that at one time uh, they might have something like that. Mm -hmm. But Schiller Park was back, uh, back quite, quite, quite a ways. That particular uh, facility I'm talking about, for some reason or other about, uh, 1935 or 40, they, they came and tore that whole hill down and they moved what dirt they had on that hill over to the other hill. There's another hill on the north, uh, north, uh, northeast corner over there by Jaeger Street and they put the dirt on there and that's the only hill we have over there at the present time. Was there a hill there prior to their moving that dirt, or did they just make that hill there, bigger? There was, a hill, there was a hill there, they just made it bigger. And over the time, it's, uh, it, at one time, I would say it would probably be close to two, twice the size it is today. Uh, we would sled on that hill and it uh, was a lot of fun. We had, uh, had a good time. So it was bigger at one time than it oh, is yes. now. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Over time, uh, time it uh, war, has been worn down. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Schiller has been there long, for a long time, back to 1891. Uh, how did he look when you were growing up? You said he was whitewashed at one point. Was Most of the time, did he look pretty good? Was he in pretty good condition? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that was an unfortunate situation. Uh, German village... Uh, at one time was, gee, I, mean, I, I, I would guess about 80% German, uh, the uh, facility that they have at the present time. Uh, we, we knew just about everybody in that, in that area. We had two churches, St. Mary's Church, which uh, 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 my family and I attended, and St. Leo's Church. Uh, there was Corpus Christi, which was out a little bit farther, and I think it's just outside of German Village. But uh, uh, we did, we did, uh, we had a lot of freedom. We had a lot of freedom. Uh, we never locked our doors. Never locked our doors. Uh, in the immediate facility where we live. Uh, people didn't move around too much. Uh, when the weather was conducive, we would go down there in somebody's house and knock on the door, and if, they, if nobody answered, we'd go ahead and sit down and have a cup of coffee. But uh, uh, no problems at all. Well, John, I don't know what else I can tell you about, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> about Schiller Park. I'd like to hear about growing up in the South End in what is now German Village when you were a kid. Okay, uh, uh, all my family attended St. Mary's School. Like I say, we lived on Whittier Street. There was no such thing as buses. Uh, there was no such thing as cancellation school because of bad weather. 
uh, we walked uh, from from uh, Whittier Street to uh, St. Mary's on Third Avenue on the, on Third Street, and. Uh, You have a lot of friends in the village? A lot of friends. So you all played at Schiller friends. Park, but did you play in backyards too? Did you go from one backyard to another? Uh, they, uh, they had a, and they, uh, we had an alley between uh, Whittier Street and, and uh, Reinhardt. Concord? And, pardon? Concord Alley? Concord Alley. It was a, a non, uh, it was a, a non-paved alley. Uh, it was mostly stone. Uh, we liked to roller skate. Uh, Reinhardt Avenue was about the only one in the vicinity that had blacktop on it, so we would skate in that street. And uh, at one time, uh, and there was a bunch of us, we, we skated, they'd be maybe 20, 25 children over there at the same time skating. Well, uh, we knew we weren't supposed to do that. At one time, the, uh, the police came and uh, they took our skates away from us. Hmm. And our parents had to go down to the police station and retrieve our skates from us and promise that we wouldn't do it anymore. Really, that promise didn't hold up too good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Concord Alley was brick, but uh, we had to skate. Hmm. And of course, we did a lot of ice skating over in, over in Schiller Park. Uh, at, at one time, they had a, uh, another bridge there. It was a, a wider bridge and it was a higher bridge. And we were able to skate under that bridge by bending down and, and going on the other side of the, of the lake. And uh, uh, people, people back then, it's just a different story, fortunately. Uh, as far as school is concerned, like I say, I uh, attended St. Mary's grade school and, high, and uh, uh, Aquinas High School. Uh, I was always pretty much of a small fella, but I participated in, in all kind of athletics. I loved tennis. At that time, uh, uh, tennis was my favorite sport. Loved, loved uh, baseball. Uh, we only had one little tennis court over there, and uh, we would play with those tennis balls until they're about the size of golf balls. Mm. But uh, we, did, uh, we did enjoy that. And, and uh, uh, your family, you had how many brothers and sisters? I had, uh, I had uh, uh, five sisters, four older than I, uh, one younger than I. My youngest sister is uh, uh, 80, 89 years old. Uh, my other four sisters were in their 90s. Uh, Two still alive, my youngest sister alive, and the, what, uh, my sister next to me is about 90. Uh, uh, She's 95. 95. We have a long life. My other sister lived about 97, and the other one was just 99. about 99. Can you tell me a little bit about what the neighborhood looked like then? You, you mentioned that practically all the streets were brick then. Very, very yeah. few had been paved over. Yeah. And what about the stores and the shops and the restaurants? Are there some that you can remember well, in particular? One of the first Kroger stores was down on Fifth Street, down close to where uh, uh, the restaurant... Uh, uh, Divos? Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, I can't think. The Mohawk? restaurant... Uh, on Fifth Street. Got the cream puffs and uh, oh, Schmitz. Schmitz, yeah. Oh, it was at what is now the, the Fudge House, Schmitz Fudge House, next door to Schmitz Restaurant. Was that the Kroger? Uh, yeah, well, 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 now wait a minute. No, uh, Kroger was on the corner of Fifth and. <laughs> Cossack? Cossack, I guess. Cossack, okay. Yeah. yeah, that would have been that, that yeah. little. Uh, Building that the, that is there today, the green painted one. Oh, okay. And then, right in that in that uh, vicinity, there was a nice house where I used to take my in the summertime. I'd take my wagon down there and get fifty pound of ice to put in our uh, ice box uh, when it was in the summertime. And at that time, uh, they, uh, they they had a large packing house there, and we'd go over and watch them unload the hogs and and uh, cattle and. Uh, uh, eventually, that was torn down, but uh, they, they, that facility they have now was the horse barn. 
-hmm. That's where they, they kept their horses. And uh, of course, they, they, they tore down the, the, uh, uh, the packing house and put some condos in there. So the ice house you mentioned, that must have been what is now Red Stable, that little... Across, right across from it, uh, yes. on the west side. It's just tiny. A little, just a little place was yeah, the ice house. Yeah, it's a gift shop now. Yeah. And I think it's been a number of things over the years, when but I, was, I had heard about an ice house. When I was real young, we didn't even have refrigeration. Uh, the ice boxes did the job. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, it's surprising. Uh, people couldn't live today with, with what we had to get by with. Mom and his war, her washboard, her, her iron that she put on the stove and, and did the ironing with, and uh, it's just a different ball game. And you didn't watch television all day? <laughs> uh, that, that's an, that, that brings something up. Uh, uh, we we're, we were allowed to watch the radio. We, I mean, I'm sorry, I listened to the radio once in a while. And at that time, there was a, a program called Jack Armstrong. He was the all-American boy. And my sisters were no more interested in Jack Armstrong than, uh, than anything at all. So we had, I had to fight him off once in a while to, so I could see Jack Armstrong. But that's just little things that happen. Uh, and that's another thing. Uh, uh, I never fought with my sisters. I, we'd have a few arguments once in a while. But uh, my father, at a very early age, says, you never put your hand on any of your sisters. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I, I never did. That's good and, advice. Uh, I, I loved, uh, even as a young kid, I loved all my sisters. Uh, there's another thing. I got a paper route when I was about 12 years old. And uh, at that time, uh, I, I, I delivered to Citizen. Uh, uh, we had three papers, the Citizen, the Journal, and the Dispatch. And uh, I was a paper boy for the Journal. And boy, I made all kind of money. That, that was the first time I was able to have some money. Allowances, there was no such thing as allowances. If I needed a pair of shoes, Dad and Mom gave me a pair of shoes, but uh, we, ne we never had allowances. And uh, so I, uh, uh, the Dispatch, Three, uh, seven days a week cost 22 cents. Had a hard time collecting that from some people. But, uh, uh, and, and we had to pay our bill. So if a, a person was kind of a deadbeat, we had some problems. Because my profit uh, uh, for a week's delivering was anywhere from 50 cents to 75 cents. Maybe a dollar once in a while. Uh, I had a, I had a, I saved most of my money. My sisters were very extravagant. Uh, they had to buy things. Charlie, I need ten dollars. Oh, that's fine. Here's a ten dollars, and you got to pay that back it's, uh, with uh, eleven dollars. I charge you ten percent for. <laughs> and would they do it? I did my own banking, so I started early. Did they do it? Did oh, they yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially my middle sister Ruth. Uh, she could, she could, she could never have anything. She was up, and she, and she's still alive too. Uh, but as far as the paper route is concerned, unless they paid, you didn't get paid, right? That's right. That's right. Hmm. Uh, we weren't allowed to stop, stop right then. But once in a while, if it got really deep, say maybe two dollars or something like that, the, the, the station manager would go over there and say you would have to pay uh, Charlie his money or we're going to stop the paper. Uh, but they just didn't stop it just like that. I can't, I can't remember once where, we, I, or where he had to stop the paper. He just had to threaten them. And you walked your route or did you ride a bicycle? I had, uh, I had a, a, a bicycle and in the, in the winter time, I used a sled. Uh, the Sundays were nothing like they are today, but they were pretty heavy. And uh, uh, we had to what we call shove the papers. We would get the main paper like you do today and they have all that advertising in. Well, uh, we, would, we would have to get over to the station on Sunday, oh, we'll say about four o'clock or something like that. And we would get our papers and then we'd get what we call the shoves and we'd put those shoves in there then. 
and then we'd take them out and del deliver our papers. Did you do that seven days a week? Seven days a week, yeah. Mm. Any and idea? That was, that was pretty good money. Yeah. Any idea how many houses you delivered to then? Uh, approximately 45 to 50. Mm -hmm. And they were close proximity. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody got the paper, uh, but uh, I went from uh, 5th Street, Whittier Street, Reinhardt, Mohawk, and some Jaeger. So I, I was pretty close. And uh, so, so many, uh, it, uh, it was right in the middle of where we lived at, on Whittier Street, so I knew most of the people that I was de delivering the papers to. And I never really had any real problem. But that, that was a big thing when I was able to uh, have some of my own income. You want to tell them about how you got your Thanksgiving turkey? Well, we would, we would have to go out and get new customers. And uh, approximately, to get a turkey, we would have to get something like five new customers. And then uh, uh, prior to Thanksgiving, a uh, few days, we would, they would give us live turkeys, and uh, we get our turkey and and take it home. And of course, at that time, uh, uh, we didn't have frozen turkeys or frozen chickens or anything. Uh, uh, Dad killed all our fowl himself and picked uh, picked them. And uh, as I got older. I did a, a lot of hunting, and uh, I, I would bring pheasant and, and rabbit and squirrel home. And uh, Dad, Dad was a good cook. In fact, uh, at times he would cook things such as uh, possum, groundhog, uh, coon. He wouldn't tell us what it was. <laughs> but. But he was a good cook, and he knew how to do it, and had no problem uh, eating it. Oh, I'd like to mention, too, uh, that uh, somebody hasn't uh, said anything for a long time. There was a, 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 a butcher shop, Erfurt's. It's right, right on the edge of a German village, and he was, he was good. He, he was good. Uh, he had, he had help, it was small, and 90% of his business was, uh, was meat. And if you wanted a piece of round steak, he'd go in his cooler and bring that quarter hind leg out, cut the round steak off, put it through the saw, and you got fresh meat all the time. Uh, my mother uh, would give me a note uh, to take over to him, normally on Saturday, and I would stand in between the cooler and the outer part of the store, and Mr. Erford would give me a hot dog and, and let me eat on a hot dog while I'm, uh, I'm there waiting to get my, get my meat. But uh, people were very, very generous back in them days. Uh, very, very generous. I've often heard of people walking to the bakery and maybe someone giving them an extra pretzel or, or, or a little piece of bread or a piece of candy or something to enjoy on the way home, the kids, while they were taking all their groceries back yeah. to their mom and dad yeah. like that. Yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, 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 dad didn't make a whole lot of money, uh, but every, just about every Saturday, uh, uh, mom would give me a $10 bill and a note and I'd go down to Kroger's which was only a, a block away, or, or two, maybe two blocks away, and, and uh, the manager would fill my bill, and, and uh, I would have a hard time. He would put all the groceries in a couple boxes, and I'd take them home. And uh, we, would, we would have enough groceries for that week for $10. Uh, uh, now, you mentioned something interesting. Back then, you wouldn't go through the aisles and put groceries in a no, cart yourself. No. You, the manager or, the, or whoever was working at the store would do that for you, right? You're right. Uh, uh, they had pickle, pickled fish there and, and, uh, and pickles, and uh, you never helped yourself. Uh, uh, the, the manager or his helper 
would, would fill your order for you. And they, they never had the variety cereal. Uh, they would have corn, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, uh, Rice Krispies, uh, shredded wheat, and... Uh, Oatmeal, maybe? Pardon? Oats? Oh, yeah, they had oats. Uh, but you go to a grocery store today and they probably got 50 to 60 varieties of uh, sweet. And there was no sweet, sweet cereal. Mm -hmm. uh, now, were there a lot of other little shops? You mentioned a meat store, but I would assume there would have been several little butcher shops, several little bakeries throughout the village. Is that right? Not several. Not several. Gee, I'm trying to think right now. Uh, bakery. Uh, Omar, maybe? Well, Omar, okay, that'll bring up another subject. That okay. I, I'm, uh, it's a little divorced from Schiller Park. But uh, uh, Omar had a bakery uh, at the corner of Whittier Street and Jaeger, across from Dibbles, and Parkview Pharmacy, which was right on the corner there. And there was, there was about... Uh, Five, five to eight acres of land there. Uh, and we call it the wrecking. Mm -hmm. at, at, at one time, there were semi-pro ball players that played ball on that wrecking. Uh, well, we did too. Uh, after, uh, after a few years after they got away from it because they opened up another park over in, uh, around 2nd Avenue over there uh, where the Pennsylvania Railroad is. But uh, anyways, this recce uh, was a place where we played, uh, played ball, uh, most, mostly baseball, flew kites, and uh, once, a, once a year in uh, May, there'd be a carnival come in there, and we'd have a carnival every May. Well, well finally, uh, they sold the front part of that uh, land to, uh, uh, to a church. And they built a church there for uh, Giant Eagle is at present time. Uh, uh, it, uh, for some reason or other, uh, the church stopped, stopped, uh, stopped services and, and left the place. And uh, then, uh, I'm trying to think, Omar Bakery came in there and took it over. And Omar, I th I'm pretty sure Omar Bakery was the last, last uh, facility that was in there. And then Giant Eagle came in yeah. and, and took over the front of it. It was Big Bear when Grandma and Grandpa was alive. Big Bear. And then Giant Eagle. That's right, it was, mm -hmm. it was Big Bear. Do you remember a gas station on that lot? Yeah, yeah. I've seen a picture that showed just a portion right. of it. Yeah, uh, my dad, when I was born, uh, like I say, he wasn't a millionaire, but he went out and bought a Model T Ford. And when I was about 12 years, well, 12 or 13, I'd sneak it in there. I, uh, 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 he would take me down to the cemetery and he'd let me drive, drive it. Well, as I got older, uh, I would drive it, and we would go into that station. And uh, at that time, they, the station was one of those things that if you wanted a gallon of gas, the, the guy would pump it up there, and then gravity would take the, um, uh, the, the gas and put it in your tank. Well, I'd go in there with a uh, while T4, and I said, I need 10 cents for today, sir. <laughs> 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 and that, that would last, uh, that would last for quite a while. Do you remember there being a fire at that Omar Bakery? Oh, yeah. Tell me about that, if you recall, because I've heard bits and pieces. Well, uh, that probably, uh, there was a big fire, and it, it probably destroyed the whole building. I, I, uh, I, I can't help but feel that at that time they, they trashed what was left. 
and and that's when Big Bear came in then. Yeah. And that was a bakery. It wasn't just a warehouse for the bakery. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't think they did any baking there or anything. Or they had their trucks in their warehouse trucks, and yeah. so forth. That's yeah. what that's what I thought. I'd like to hear a little bit about your your parents and your grandparents because your family in this area goes way back, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, we 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 go back quite a ways. As far as the, 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 the Kramers are concerned. Uh, you want to tell them about um, the Easter tradition that Grandpa used oh, to do? Uh, there, there's a, a little t tradition <clears throat> that came from Germany that was picked up by my, my parents. And as far as I know, we, we were the only one, uh, my dad was the only one that did it. Uh, Easter Saturday, uh, weather permitting, he would go out with uh, a sticks about a foot long and a little bigger than my thumb. And he'd make a round Easter nest and put a little a gate on it. And this was the Easter bunny's nest. And then he would, he would get some hay and he'd put it in that nest. Now, he not only did that for we, we uh, five children, but he did it for about 10 of the neighbors. He would go around to these neighbors who had one or so children and build them a nest. And then that afternoon, late afternoon, he would sneak in there and put a, a piece of candy or something in there. And they all look forward to that every year. And to this day, and I know I'm the only one that does it, I still build Easter nests for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. How wonderful, and that's a German tradition. That's a German tradition. Yeah. Where it came from or how it happened, or uh, I can't understand uh, why I've never heard of it or seen it before, because like I say, most of that area was German. We were talking before the camera started, and were your parents German or were, was it your grandparents? who? My grandparents. Grandparents, yeah. and, and they came over from Germany, correct? Uh, yes. Well, it, one did. Um, his grandfather, Grandpa Wolf, uh, came in 1874 with his sister and two parents. And then his, his wife, uh, Mary Whitman, she came over uh, with her family, I think it was 1861, 60, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, they met somehow and married. And they lived on Mohawk. And across the street from Mohawk was Mary, I'm sorry, it's not Whitman, it's um, Shrek. Um, Mary Shrek and Louis Wolf. And across the street was Mary Shrek's mom and dad and her three brothers lived there. And um, they died there. Um, and, um, then, let's see, we would go back for the Kramer side, we'd go back, his second great-grandfather came over in 1838. 1838, yeah. to the south side of Columbus. Um, they went to Chillicothe first, and then they came here. And the way they went to Chillicothe was, uh, I have a newspaper article, they're from hessen darstadt Germany, and they would work together, raise enough money to bring part of the families over, then the families here would work, send money back to bring the other families over. Hmm. So they brought a whole community. That's interesting. And then after my great-great-grandfather died in the Civil War, then my second great-grandmother came up here with her two children, which would one his grandfather. I've read of instances in which perhaps the father would come over first from Germany and then would send for the mother and the children. The whole family yeah. came. Yeah. But not necessarily all at the same time because they didn't have enough money, right? Yeah, they, but his whole family came. It was um, his mom and dad, and there were, let's see, Adam, Martin, Jacob, five children, Elizabeth and John. Mm -hmm. And they all came with him. John had just turned, just been born. Did they build houses down here in the south end, these uh, grandparents and great-grandparents? Everything was brick, brick down yeah. then. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of small houses. Uh, uh, in our particular case, uh, uh, my, my four sisters slept in one room, 
And uh, I had a real small facility in the back. It uh, uh, what, wasn't very big. Kind of was... under like the eaves or whatever, mm -hmm. where the, the house peaked is where he was. Yeah. A loft of some sort. Well, it was right off the girl's room, but uh -huh. um, it was more of a, could you stand up in it? In the center, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just about. It was it was pretty small. Yeah. And it, pretty cold, right? Oh cold. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we had uh we had big comforters and man I get underneath there and 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 I, I boy on, especially on Sunday morning, oh it was miserable to try to get out of there. Uh we had a furnace, coal furnace in a basement, and then it was a gravity furnace, uh, no blower or anything. Uh, and by the time that heat got, uh, well, I had no heat at all, but uh, the girls had a register in their room, and uh, they fight on who's going to stand over that register <laughs> <laughs> to get dressed. And then in the summer, I assume being upstairs, it was pretty oh, hot, it was wasn't hot. it? It was hot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, German, do you remember a lot of German being spoken uh, among your family? Just, just, uh, just my mom and grandmother. Yeah, like I said before, if, uh, uh, if they didn't want us to hear uh, what they're talking about, they would speak German. <laughs> a lot of the prayer books were in German. Mm -hmm. uh, the mass missalettes and so forth were in German. I still have those. Um, family Bible wasn't in German. No. Um, yeah, I think that's... About it was with grandma and great grandma talking back and forth. Yeah, not not a whole lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Because as you said, your your father, of course, was not German. Was he uh, English or? or? Well, no. uh, he, he was German. Uh, he was. Okay. Yeah. His dad, his, his but from dad his... was German. Okay. Uh, he spoke English. Now, um, Grandpa Wolf, he's the one that came from Germany. He never spoke German, did he? No. He didn't even have an accent. Dad said. No. Hmm. No, I never and heard. He was uh, 16 Grand, when Grandpa he came Wolf here. He basically came so he wouldn't have to fight for the Kaiser. Mm -hmm. And he was the only boy in the family. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mr. Kramer, were you in the military ever? Uh, yes, I was in the Navy. Uh, I was 17 and senior at Aquinas. Uh, that was in 1944. Uh, at that time. Uh, there wasn't too many eligible people back here to replace, uh, replace the people that they needed. Uh, and so, uh, especially as far as the Army was concerned, uh, most recruits were going into the Army. And when you became 18 and out of school, they, uh, uh, they drafted you, and most of these people were drafted in the Army. Now. I have nothing against the Army, but seeing some of them pictures of these guys uh, laying in snow, not getting anything to eat or anything, uh, I said, I, I, gotta, I gotta join before I graduate because I don't want one in the Army. Uh, so uh, uh, in November of uh, 1944, there was myself and about eight other uh, seniors who wanted to do the same as I. And uh, so the priest, uh, the principal there, we went to him and said, asked him if it was possible if we could enlist before we turn 18 so we don't get drafted. Well, we, we only had uh, uh, a few months to go before we graduate. And so he gave us credit for our boot camp. And so we, uh, we all enlisted and, and I enlisted uh, uh, when I was 17, the, the day before I, I was 18. And uh, uh, I had boot camp at Great Lakes uh, in Chicago. Uh, from there, I uh, 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 um, February, February, I was shipped out to uh, Oakland, California. Uh, and from there, uh, I was uh, uh, sent on a boat to uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, fortunate for me, and because I'm here today, I, I, 
uh, developed tonsillitis on the way going over there. And it was rather serious. And so they, they took me off the boat in a stretcher and took me to the hospital. I was in the hospital for uh, a couple of weeks and be, uh, got well. But uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I was lost from my whole company. I was, I was all myself. I knew nobody. Uh, and uh, so eventually, uh, I was uh, assigned uh, in the Marshall Islands to an island called Enewetok. Uh It was a, a, a small island that had an airport. Uh, uh, we. Uh, uh, we, uh, well, I was in charge. Well, I was put in charge of a, what they call a tank farm. We had aviation gas there, and what what would happen? Uh, they would uh, bring the carriers' planes in, and we would gas them up and send them send them back out again. And uh, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of my friends in that company didn't come back. Uh, I lost an awful lot of them. I was very fortunate in having tonsillitis because I was assigned good duty. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it was a little hazardous uh, because uh, myself and four other fellows uh, uh, stayed at the end of the island where these tanks were in case the Japs were able to uh, uh, bomb us, and, and we had to stay there. Uh, fortunately, they never got any bombs into us, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, so, uh, and, and then uh, I, was, I, uh, I was discharged in August of 1946 and came home and started to live a playboy life. <laughs> I was only 25 years old and uh, I had a good job. I had a new car, and uh, uh, I was really enjoying life. And what kind of business did you go into then? Well, at, uh, at that time, uh, I was, uh, uh, a lot of friends of mine at the park uh, were, uh, were just coming back from the service, and they were going into the fire department. And uh, I said, well, that don't sound too bad. So uh, I said, when are you going up to, when's the test? And they told me when the test was. And be, uh, just a day before that happened, I got a call from a very good friend of mine, Cap Hoover of the YMCA. And he, has, he said he has a friend who needs an employee at a window shade company downtown called Joanna Western Mills. And uh, I asked him about it, uh, what it consists of and everything. And, I felt that, uh, well, that's not, not, not a bad job. And so I never did take a fireman's test. And so I worked at, uh, at Joanna Western Mills uh, for quite a while. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I had, uh, along with some of the jobs that I had at Joanna Western Mills, I was in charge of the shipping department. So I had a lot of uh, sales, rep sales representatives from the various ship, uh, shipping companies call on me to try to acquire my business for uh, shipping these uh, window shades throughout the country. And I developed a good relationship with all of them, but one in particular, which was a, a Navy pilot that cracked up, and uh, uh, his name was Phil Knoll. Uh, uh, he was about five, six years older than I, and, I, uh, and Phil is still alive. Uh, uh, one day he came over and said, Charlie, we need a, a, a salesman over at the Bell Lines. Uh, this Bell Lines was a, a small carrier out of Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, uh, they serviced uh, West Virginia, Virginia, and the Carolinas pretty much. And, and he said, uh, uh, Charlie, we, we need a salesman. How about coming over and working for us? I said, Phil. I said, I never sold anything in my life. And he said, Charlie, let me tell you something. 
There's two things about being a, a, a good salesman and making a good living. First of all, you have to be yourself. You, you, you have to be friendly. You have to uh, have something to sell, which I did. There was only one other West Virginia carrier in and around Columbus. And he said, all you have to do is go around and talk to these people as we have been coming to you, tell them of your service that you have and try to acquire their business. And uh, I said, what have I got to lose? I've got, I've got five children, I'm making $100 a week. Uh, uh, I think when I went over there, I maybe made 150 or something like that. But uh, uh, Phil took me under his wings. For a few weeks, I made sales calls with him and, and got to be, be familiar with their territory and everything. And after that, I, they gave me my own territory, went out on my own, and loved it. Uh, loved it. Smith was a family, family get-together, and at that time, uh, uh, they started a retirement program for their, their people, which I was part of. And uh, uh, for quite a while, I worked with them, oh, maybe 10 years. And uh, there was another company in town, Smith Transfer. And uh, they, they talked to me quite often. Uh, the manager here was Jack Boyer, wonderful person. Uh, Jack and I played a lot of tennis together. Uh, they wanted me to come to work for them. I said, uh, you guys are great. I wouldn't mind working for you. Bell Lines has given me a good job. I got good security. I got retirement. Uh, I, I, can't, I, can't, uh, I can't change. About a year later, Smith Transfer bought Bell Lines. The president had come in, which I met before, said, Charlie, the only way we got you was to buy the company. <laughs> and you were with them for the rest of your career. Yeah. yeah. And so Smith, again, another thing, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, great person, great person, accepted all of Bell Lines' uh, uh, time and uh, the, their vacation time, which was in the form of an annuity, and he carried all their back time and, and put it on with, with Smith. Well, I, I, of course, then worked with Smith and, until I was about uh, 80, no, not that old. You were 60, 60, I was in my 60s, because I was just getting ready, about 63, and uh, Unfortunately, Smith, uh, Mr. Mr. Smith sold his company to Conrad out of Philadelphia, which knew nothing about the business. They, they were good business people that wanted to buy a good company. They bought the company, sold all the equipment, made a fortune, leased the equipment back, and started to run the company, which at that, they just didn't know what they were doing. Prior to that, I, I had been made sales manager, and I had uh, three people working with me at that time. And I, I go back to what uh, Mr. Null told me a long time ago. If you don't have something to sell, you got problems. And I had nothing to sell. The company was bad. So I, I quit uh, prior, to, prior to 62 and went to work with my son, who is in the fire department building houses. And then I uh, 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 worked with him building houses until I had a heart attack about, uh, about age 70. And uh, I had uh, angioplastic, which is, they put that balloon in you and shoot you. And uh, they took care of me. And uh, so uh, I worked with him uh, for for quite for quite a while, but then I, then I had to had had to stop. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty much the end of my end of my career. Except I I had a hard time not doing anything. So my my wife and I went to went to work for our company. It's been so long I can't even remember the name of it. But uh, we we do what you see in the stores today, uh, demo st stuff. I loved it. I got to see people again, and I got to do that. And I, I did that, that for quite a while and, until uh, 
my wife and I both gave up. Mm -hmm. And so uh, um, uh, my, my son Charlie and I and, and her uh, and uh, uh, my brother-in-law, Bill Lauber, built a house up in Goleta, uh and I lived there for 10 years, and I wasn't getting any better, so uh, my wife and I determined that we better get in close to something, which we bought a condo in Westoville, and um, uh, we lived there for 12 years, and I lost my wife uh, three years ago to Alzheimer's, mm. and that's the way it is now. Uh, I try to stay active over at uh, uh, Westerville Athletic Club. Uh, I was very active in, in racquetball for about three years. I loved it. I loved the people. But I, I, I lost my equilibrium and I was falling and I was afraid I was going to hurt myself. Was, well, that didn't work too good because I was in the yard digging up a tree and fell and broke my shoulder. <laughs> so that, that was about uh, three weeks ago. And this is it now, Don, John. But you were playing pickleball, handball, and no. did you ever hear pickleball? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, it's a great oh, sport. They brought it up from from Florida. It's, it's it's anyone can play it, but it's basically set for uh, uh, older people. It's a small court about a badminton sword, and you use a wiffle ball and a Smaller and a, and a wooden racket, and uh, uh, it's like a badminton court, and a net about thirty six inches high. Wow. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, but uh, we have about, uh, over to recreation, I, I would guess about 150 people playing that. Uh, and you still I, play? Well, no, mm -hmm. I, I, I was afraid I was going to get hurt. Uh, With the equilibrium. John, but I, um, I, it's a crazy thing. I'd probably have been better off. I maybe wouldn't have broke my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he stopped playing probably um, this summer mm -hmm. uh, because he had fallen. Uh, a couple times, so I'm sure he could still play, but he just uh, kind of loses his balance once yeah. in a while. And yeah, they, he, uh, last year, he participated in the Ohio Senior Olympics, and he won three silver medals and two gold medals. Really? He won in pickleball, a silver and a, a gold. He won in racquetball. And he won in golf, a silver and a, a bronze. No, uh, silver, silver and gold was gold. in, a, in a racquetball. racquetball. Okay, and then, and then I a, won a silver and gold. That's pretty amazing. Golf. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. And, and then was, I start falling apart. <laughs> yeah. And then he started, um, he, they were, he was supposed to go to Wisconsin for, for the finals for the National Olympics, mm -hmm. but he didn't want to go. And I said, come on, Dad, I'll take you. And he didn't want to go. Yeah. So well, that's he's always been very active in sports. Um. Well, I, I'll have to say, it's not that I would, had that much ability, but when you're 90 years old, there's not too many of them out there uh, in these type of activities that are very good. Right. But I've been playing golf since I was 12 years old, and, and I play, I play uh, in the summertime with a retired fireman, and uh, I play at least once a week. And, and uh, I really enjoy it. And, well, that's wonderful. And uh, I'm a bo 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 bogey golfer, and, <laughs> and I don't know what's going to happen with the shorter thing, but I'm going to play golf until they throw dirt in my face. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charlie, thank you so much. I could talk to you all day, but I know you've, all, you've got to get going, and I want to see some photos here as well. Sure. I had one more thing to add. Please. His grandfather, the Wolves that lived on Mohawk, he worked at, for Columbus Watch Company. Oh, did he? He worked there on Thurman Avenue, mm -hmm. and uh, so he worked there till he retired. Or I, I'm thinking, Grandpa was it ninety? I don't know his age. Because well, till he retired, and they were very poor. But he was a big farmer too. He did a lot of farming in his yard. I mean, uh, this was Charlie's father's father, or mother's. This is his mother's father. Mother's father. The ones, uh, the wolves. Mm -hmm. Lewis Wolf that came over in 1874. Um, and here are two pictures of their backyard on Mohawk that they were um, uh, them farming. That's what their yards looked like. On Mohawk. On Mohawk, yeah. 
Most people had gardens back in them days. And Grandpa was a big gardener. And then my, his wife, Mary Wolf, very religious. She used to, um, uh, homeless people used to come to her back step and she would make egg sandwiches for them. And they would sit there, she'd give them coffee and egg sandwiches. Um, she uh, was real big in the community when it came to the church and so forth. And then, um, but he then, after grandma passed, his grandmother passed, uh, Grandpa Wolf moved in with his family. And then this is dad's family, his parents and his sisters at the time. Mm -hmm. And Charlie is in here? He's the only boy. The girls are at the top with him, second one down. Right, right. Charlie, I wanted to ask you, growing up, did you have chickens? The people around here raise chickens in their backyard still? Uh, yes, my, grand, yeah. my grandfather had chickens and pigeons. He had homing pigeons. Pigeons, and you probably remember quite a few outhouses in the backyards too, don't you? Uh, I'm trying, we, we didn't have one. Uh, my my uh, grandma and grandpa Wolf, they had one. Oh, no. And uh, Kramer's, they had inside plumbing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Grape arbors? Pardon? Did you have grape arbors in your backyard for, for wine making and that sort of thing? Well, yeah. Some of that. Yeah. I'm Mary, sorry, John. I... No, that's fine. Mary, I, now tell me about the prof or the semi-professional photographer. Okay, that is his father, Joseph, uh, Charles Joseph. And he, I have several pictures in here that he has taken, but he took a lot of family photographs. Um, I, um, he started pretty young because he only went to eighth grade and he was taking pictures right out of school. And he was a lithographer, so he needed to take pictures for that. I know he developed all this film at work. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, Charlie, why didn't you go to St. Mary's High School? You said you went to Aquinas. Went to Aquinas. Uh, I wanted to go to St. Mary's. As I, as I, as I said, I, I knew all these people. I knew I would be able to play sports at St. At St. Mary's. Uh, because the coaches there uh, knew of, of what ability I had. And I was, I was at that time, I probably would weigh, weighed up about 120 pounds. Uh, uh, but uh, Dad thought it would be better for, uh, for me to be uh, uh, around uh, the Aquinas, which was uh, uh, teachers who were all priests, and uh, much discipline. Much, but much dis discipline. Uh, he couldn't get by with anything out there. Uh, today, uh, if if they had the rules they had then, uh, today they had then, all the priests would be in jail. Uh, they they wore they, they they wore belts about this wide around there, and. Uh, if, uh, if, you would, if you would do something wrong, uh, uh, they would ask you to come over and bend over and touch your toes. And that belt would get you in the behind. Now, to my knowledge, nobody ever got hurt, uh, hurt, but they got stung a lot. And we, none of us wanted that belt. Mm -hmm. uh, Dad, Dad knew of this, not that I was a, a bad child, I don't think I was. But he thought I'd get a better education out there. At that time, Aquinas was very superior in all athletics. Uh, I played pretty good football. Uh, played a lot of football uh, in uh, grade school, in independent teams, and uh, uh, the uh, the coach at that time was uh, was a. Good coach Frank Zadorny, but he was a lot, a lot like the, the, the a lot of the coaches today. He had, a, he had to weigh 180, 170 pounds, 
in order to play the game. Uh, well, uh, I went out for the team, and we would have sprints, and uh, nine times out of 10, I could beat anybody in a 100-yard dash. But he would never let me play. Uh, so I played independent ball then, and we had a, we had a, uh, a team in Schiller Park. Jack, De Jack Dempsey was our coach. We played independent ball, and we played different teams from other parks and, and, and things. And uh, we, had a, we had a real good team. In fact, uh, uh, South High School, which is a little bit outside of German Village, uh, uh, at times we would scrimmage with them, and we could, we could beat their, their team mm -hmm. uh, at, at ball. And they did have some 170, 80-pound guys. I think the biggest guy we had, we did have one guy that weighed about 140 or so. But you, we were all small guys. You mentioned Jack Dempsey. He was related, uh, associated with uh, the old Mohawk restaurant when it was Elk's Tavern, I think. That a could lot. be. Yeah. That could be. I, I don't know if he was a, a manager or an, a co-owner of that or, or what. But, uh, but uh, well, Charlie, thank I'm you. Not, I'm not sure. Thank you very, very much. This has been a great pleasure. Oh.